So Donnie is out this evening, and I'll be uh, conducting the study as much as I can. I kind of joked to Donnie, if I'm skilled enough, I can, uh, I can do this. It was actually in context of having the, the younger age questions and also the, the questions for the adults, and uh, I don't, don't think I was able to do that. But none, nonetheless, we'll study chapter 18 tonight. Um, as we normally do, we've been uh, looking through the book of Joshua, and uh, before we get into the chapter, what we'll do is we'll go through a review of each chapter to kind of refresh us as to how we got to where we are in chapter 18. So the first chapter of Joshua uh, reminded us of how Joshua prepared for the conquest and the battle, not just Joshua, but the children of Israel. Uh, continuing there, the spies were sent out to Jericho in chapter 2 uh, to see the land there. Uh, crossing over the Jordan is what the children of Israel did in chapter 3. Uh, and we remember all of the occasion there of setting up the stones, of the ark passing through, and all of the things that took place till they got to Gilgal. Chapter 4 uh, of Joshua speaks of those memorial stones that were set up. Chapter 5 talks about the second generation is circumcised. They're keeping the law. Now they're going into the promised land. They're bringing themselves back to what God commanded. Chapter 6 is going to be the children of Israel taking the city of Jericho. Uh, chapter 7 uh, brings us to the defeat at Ai. That's not the defeat of Ai, but the children of Israel suffering defeat because of sin and how they dealt with that. 8 is the victory now at Ai after the children of Israel have dealt with that sin. Chapter 9 is the treaty with the Gibeonites. I wonder if I need to get over here to let others see. Chapter 9 is the treaty with the Gibeonites who made themselves look like they were from a far country. Uh, Israel did that with them. Chapter 10 talks about the conquest of the south. When they enter into the land, they go southward and take the land there and uh, fight against the people of the land there and take it. Chapter 11 is the conquest of the north. Once the south is, is taken, the north is taken as well. So that brings us to chapter 12 where the kings that are conquered in the land are mentioned, the ones that are conquered by Moses and Joshua and the lands that they are from there. Chapter 13 talks about the division of the land on the east side, the kingdoms that were taken there, and also uh, Gad, uh, Reuben, and half of the tribe of Manasseh are mentioned there in that section. Chapter 14 talks about the land on the west. Caleb is going to inherit his land, and uh, some of the division that takes place there in the west is given. He's given Hebron. Chapter 15 talks about more of that division of the land where land is given to Judah. And we see some of the things that take place there that they weren't able to drive out some of the inhabitants. And 17, we discussed last week, division more, uh, more division of the land of the west on the west side of the uh, Jordan and uh, the land that is given to Ephraim and the other portion of Manasseh. So those things were discussed and talked about, and that's where we are uh, through where we've studied in the book of Joshua. We're now about to discuss chapter 18, uh, looking into our division of the uh, book of Joshua, the first uh, five chapters discuss about crossing over the river and going into the land through there. Chapter 16 talks about conquering the land, uh, overtaking the enemy. And the last portion of the book, chapters 13 through 14, which is where we are now, talk about the actual division of the land, the claiming of the inheritance, God's promise being revealed to the children of Israel. So we have these things take place now in chapter uh, 13 through 24. Also, the, the next section where we are there in chapters 15 through 19, we're on the west side of the Jordan. We're in western Canaan now. We've already discussed where we were on the other side in chapters 13 and 14. So chapters 15 through 19 discuss the rest of the division of the children of Israel and their land as they go into the promised land. So um, that is where we are going to be this evening. And um, as we continue to get into this, the, the first 10 verses... Uh, discuss some of the, the, the actual setting of how things take place and how the first part of that land is divided up. And the rest of the chapter discusses places and, and the borders of uh, the land there uh, that is claimed and taken. So just a rough breakdown of chapter 18. Um, I wanted us to look very uh, quickly now um, at the uh, first 10 chapters. There's quite a bit of things that we could point out in this section of chapter one through uh, verses 1 through 10 that are worthy of note. Um, and I think we'll do well to pay attention to some of those things. When you read some of these things, it, 
it, it's not easy to follow along, and sometimes you have to flip through here and there, but, but I hope to make some good points out of what we are going to discuss this evening. So in the first 10 verses of chapter 18, let's look at that real briefly in the breakdown of that. In the first two verses, there are quite a bit of things. There are three things at least that I wanted us to look at. When you read that verse or those verses there, um, it's almost like, well, I'm reading history, but, but notice some things that are taking place there. If you're there in your Bible with me, Joshua chapter 18, let's look at verses 1 and 2. Look there with me in verse 1. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there. And the land was subdued before them. In verse 2, but there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. So we've got the setting of chapter 18 to where portions of the children of Israel have already gotten their land and have already begun to take it. But it says there in the first verse, the congregation assembled together. And where do they assemble together? At Shiloh. If we remember going back in chapters 13 and 14, after they, or actually earlier than that, after they crossed over the Jordan River, where did they establish camp? But it was at Gilgal. And that's where the tabernacle was rested. And that's where, as they went into the land, they would come back and rest. And that would be the camp of the army of Israel. Well, now that camp has moved from Gilgal into Shiloh. And it appears after the first uh, series of years, the seven years there, that they're in the uh, land overtaking it. And as the land is going to be subdued, that's where they are after they move from Gilgal. They're in verse 1 here in chapter 18. Uh, just a, a couple of things I wanted to note about Shiloh here. Um, this is the, the next portion of uh, area that they do settle after they're going into the land. And whether or not it was the, the choosing of a place, it is in the center almost, if you look at the map. I wonder if I could easily get to that. Probably can't. But um, look here with me at the map here. If you'll see the center there on the board, see uh, Ephraim and Benjamin here in the center. I bet if I mashed a button, I would shut us off there. But in the center, you have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Well, looking a little closer at um, the map there, you'll see Shiloh on the eastern side of Ephraim. Looking back at our map, Ephraim's still in the center of the land. And it's kind of interesting that that's now where they go and set up. And furthermore, if we consider that that's the center of Israel, um, that's also going to be where the tabernacle will remain until later when the Philistines uh, are able to conquer Israel and take the ark and take it back with them and all the things that happen in the land of, I said Israel, I meant the Philistines, where the Philistines take the ark and they capture it, but yet they send it back later. We see that uh, that's where it's going to be, and that's way on down in 1 Samuel. And we also see that that's where Eli the priest serves at the tabernacle. We also will see later on in 1 Samuel where uh, Elkanah and his wife, they go there to worship each time each year, and that's where she will pray for a son. And that son that she will be blessed at that tabernacle at Shiloh is going to be Samuel, the prophet. So all these things take place there at Shiloh, and it's important that we notice this is where it began. This is where that instance happened where Shiloh was chosen. Now, I say chosen there too. Was it, was it just circumstance that that land was chosen there for the tabernacle to dwell? I, I don't believe so, and I think God revealed it a little earlier back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. He hints at that. He said, where I set my place up, where I, I show you, that's where you're going to go worship. You won't do like you did back in Israel. So, so this fits with what is going on and taking place. And we'll get to a, a couple more scriptures that kind of indicate that. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 7, it's also mentioned where God had set his name. It was in Shiloh. He set his name there for children, the children of Israel to worship. And God revealed that there in Jeremiah chapter 7 and also chapter 26. But then also in, in Psalm chapter 78, God mentions where I set up my tabernacle to worship, I have forsaken Shiloh. So it's not just by chance that the location of Shiloh was, was noticed and taken by Joshua or the children of Israel. That's where God indicated the tabernacle was going to be set up for them to worship. So interesting enough, we see the progress of the children of Israel and the tabernacle um, where God would meet them and they would go to worship, they're being set up. So if you, if you just happen to read it and don't really take it in, you kind of miss those points and those nuggets, but at the same time, that's where God had set up his worship 
and God wanted the children of Israel to go. So the second part of what we read there in chapter uh, 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 18, verse 2, is uh, the land, actually it's before we get into verse 2, it's there in verse 1, the land was subdued before them. That's interesting as well. We've already talked about in our brush up with the re review in Joshua of how the south was taken and then the north was taken. So it's almost like there is no main struggle to take the land that God has promised. They have taken it now. It's subdued. It's not completely overtaken. As we noticed last week and also the week before, some of those tribes that go into the land, they don't take those things that God gives them to take. And it's not because they couldn't. Scripture mentions they couldn't take them because of chariots of iron. But God had already told them he would be with them and he was going to help them subdue the land if they would go in and take it. But we see that some of those tribes that went in before, they couldn't take some of those portions of land. And I think that's going to speak to the attitude of where we are in just a minute in verse number 2. But, again, the land was subdued, so there was no more need of a main struggle with a main army. Now that these tribes were there and the land was subdued, they could go and they could take their portion. And that's what we see getting up into verse number 2. So, the land being subdued, they're rested now with the tabernacle, and the children of Israel are gathered together there at Shiloh. We find the instance there in verse 2, there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Well, you might have thinking, well, there's only a short amount of time that this has happened, and maybe, you know, that's just because they've had so much going on. We, we, don't, we don't read that, though, in the next verse in chapter uh, 18, verse 3. Joshua tells us what has happened. There in verse 3, Joshua says, Then Joshua said to the children, of, or it said of Joshua, Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? So we see some, some attitude of neglecting to go into the land. We, we kind of hinted at it already by some of the tribes not going and taking their possessions fully, but leaving either some of those people taskmasters or not taking the city completely. So th that same attitude is in the remainder of the seven tribes. Joshua is almost under rebuke here. How long are you going to neglect that to go and do God's will? And I find that interesting. Here's Joshua still after all the thing has been accomplished of taking the land and subduing it. Joshua still wants the children of Israel to go and, and do God's will and to lead them to do that. And he's still encouraging them. He hasn't given up and said, well, my job's finished. I'm, I'm done and it's over. But he's still progressing and still wanting to continue to encourage them to take the land. Why would you neglect that land? So the setting here is that there's still land to take and there's still an attitude of not going in to take it. Joshua commands them, therefore, since that hasn't happened, down in uh, verse 4. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, looking at the... Um, Question number one, I will go over that and try to try to do like Donnie does there. Uh, the short summary, also, we've already talked about that in chapter 18. The remainder of the land's divided, and we're going to talk about the rest of the chapter, uh, Benjamin, uh, the territory there being divided. And also where we find question number two, where the whole congregation assembled and why? It was Shiloh, and the reason why they assembled there was because that's where God instructed them. Uh, scripture indicated that, and that's also where we find the tabernacle resting and God dwelling with the children of Israel. So... After the land was subdued, they go and they, uh, they're there at Shiloh. So let's get into the rest of the chapter after that. <clears throat> Verse number three now. After we read where Joshua asked him, how long are you going to neglect to go and possess the land? He says there, pick out from among you three men from each tribe, and I will send them. They shall rise and go through the land, survey it according to their inheritance, and come back to me. So again, if you have seven remaining tribes that have not gotten their land, um, then naturally you would have 21 uh, people that are going into the land. And, and I find this important as well. When the people, uh, the children of Israel are first instructed to go back into the land to, to, to look at it, they're told in Numbers chapter 13 to spy out the land. It's because the land wasn't subdued yet. And furthermore, God was wanting them to go and take the land so it wasn't as easy as just going and walking and scouting out and surveying the land then. We see they failed in doing that, and we see them wandering in the wilderness some 40 years until they get back to the point where they're about to go back into the land, getting the second opportunity. So here, Joshua is telling them to go and survey the land according to their inheritance and come back to me, 
And he says how to do that in verse 5, they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall remain in their territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall remain in their territory on the north. So this land in between Joseph, or Ephraim and Manasseh, and the land uh, of Judah, that land there, and we looked at it earlier. we we'll jump back to the map and look about where we're talking. So you see Ephraim and Manasseh, and also Judah here on the left side, this is the location that is being spoken about. Benjamin right there in the center, Dan to the west, hasn't been uh, divided yet. But nonetheless, right there in the orange, that's where we are looking at. That land sandwiched between Judah and the two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, that's where jo uh, Joshua is telling the children of Israel to go and survey the land. So they're supposed to get seven uh, sections and survey it and come back. Uh, there in verse 6, you shall therefore survey the land in seven parts and bring the survey here to me. Now, stopping there, it would make sense for a leader, once he gets the information, to go ahead and set about how things are going to be divided, set about how things are going to take place and, and be divvied up. Joshua doesn't do that. What does he do after he will get the information? He says, I'm going to God with it. He says there, I'm going to cast lots. That's God's decision. He would be the one to make the decision from the casting of lots. So again, the leadership of Joshua, the spiritual leadership that he would be giving would be devotion to God. I'm going to do what God says, and the children of Israel will need to follow if God is still going to be with them. So through all this, we see Joshua giving the instruction of going into the land, of setting up the survey, and coming back and bringing that back to Joshua so that he can bring it before the Lord and let the Lord decide who was going to get what areas. <clears throat> So we see that there in verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, verse 6. After bringing that back, he would uh, describe that the Levites were to not going to get any part among them, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. I don't know if you've been making notes, and I can't really remember us pointing it out in our classes, but I did a, a little quick search about what the Levites were promised and, and what they were told would be theirs by God. And if, if you wanted to make a marginal note of some of these and go back and look at them, in Numbers chapter 18, uh, verses 21, 20, and 24, the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Uh, that's mentioned there in verse 20. But before that, God mentions, I am the inheritance. He's saying God himself is the inheritance to the Levites. So that's kind of where we first see that uh, indication that the Levites are going to have spiritual or going to have parts of God and godliness to their inheritance. They're not going to have territories. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, they shall have no uh, part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Therefore, they shall have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he said to them. Again, the Lord being what is going to come to them. Joshua 13, uh, earlier on, in verse 14, talks about that uh, sacrifice again. That's going to be their inheritance. Uh, verse 33 of chapter 13, um, the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. Uh, so again, uh, in chapter 8, verse uh, we just talked about there in verse 7, the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. So the children of uh, Levi here not going to receive that land, that being an indication uh, by Jacob, uh, Joshua being set up here and rem uh, reminded to the children of Israel what was going to take place for them. I thought it interesting to go back and, and bridge that with the things we already have learned and looked at that was going to take place with the tribe of Levi. Their service was God's service. Their service was going to be one of spiritual leadership and priesthood and serving at the tabernacle and later the temple in worship to God. That would be their portion. So, Okay, looking a little further then, after uh, Joshua says that there in verse 7, <coughs> See, I lost my place. There and at, after the priesthood being the inheritance of the children of Levi, and Gad and Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan on the east. We've already talked about that, about how the land on the east was already divided. That would be Gad, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh. They received theirs on the east side of Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So, reminding the people after this, go survey the land and those who go, write it down in the book and bring it back here to me, and we will get the division of the land by God and by what God has said. 
and that will be what happens. He's already having to remind them again, just to draw back to where we are, that they're neglecting to take it. So he's nudging them and, and saying, go do what God has said and take the land. And again, going back to the idea about it being subdued, it, it was theirs for the taking. They just had to go and God would be with them, but it was just a matter of getting them to go. Um, continuing then from there in verse 8, <clears throat> The division is going to begin here down through uh, the rest of the chapter. We'll see what was divided. But here in verse 8, the men arose and go away. And Joshua charged those who went to survey the land, saying, Go, walk through the land, survey it, and come back to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed through the land and wrote the survey in a book in seven parts by cities. And they came to Joshua at the camp in Shiloh. Now again, notice the, the ease by which it seems as though this happens. There, there's no event recorded when these men go out and they survey the land. That's because the land's already subdued. Most of the enemy has been overcome. It's just a matter of getting into the pockets of resistance. Donnie mentioned earlier that they would have to go and they would have to take. So it's almost as if they're, they're walking through the land in that area and just without any trouble, without any fighting, we don't see anything recorded there. But nonetheless, what happens after that takes place after they go through the land they come back to Joshua um, I find it interesting here that these men were obedient to what was being said and done and they didn't give up a fuss they didn't give up any fighting about it but they went and simply did as they were instructed so we see the fruits of what happened they come back they brought the book there at the end of verse 9 to Joshua at the camp in Shiloh and then in verse 10 what do we see Joshua doing Joshua was going to take that book and take the lots that were prepared for going before the Lord and cast them in Shiloh before the Lord. And it says there, Joshua divided the land into the children of Israel according to their divisions. So we see all taking place. It happened in this way so that the division of the land would continue. And those seven tribes, we won't get to each one of them in this chapter, but we will discuss, as we see at the beginning of verse 11, that the tribe of Benjamin receiving their inheritance. So um, we'll get to that. I want to make sure I cover any questions that were on here. Um, I think question three we've already asked, how was the division of the land determined? By casting lots. Uh, and the men were sent out to survey the land and bring back what they found to Joshua. And then also question number four, how many, how many men surveyed the land? There were three from each tribe, so seven tribes. There were 21 total. Um, in uh, verse five also, how many parts was the rest of the land divided? The seven parts that were mentioned and, and surveyed, uh, that would be the amount there. So that we get to question seven, we'll actually get there in just a minute. We're in question, or, or verse 11. We'll pick up there after looking over those questions. But in verse 11, we see that the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families, and the ter territory of their lot came out between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. That was the land we were looking at earlier. Um, there sandwiched between Ephraim and Judah. That land there uh, that says Benjamin, you can barely read it. Let me see if I can blow that up a little more. Let's see, maybe I can do it that way. So there where the circle is, that's the land we're looking at. And we'll describe its borders in just a moment. But to get a little closer, that would be the area that Benjamin would get by the casting of lots to the Lord, by the hand of Joshua going before and letting the Lord decide that territory. Let's look there in verses 11 through, I guess, the rest of the chapter now for the remainder of the time we have. Um, verse 11 there says, Now the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families, and the territory of their lot came out between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. Verse 12 says, Their border on the north side began at the Jordan. So coming down the Jordan River on the east side there, uh, and the border went up to the side of Jericho on the north and went up through the mountains westward. So it ended at the wilderness of Beth-Avon. The border went over there from toward Luz to the side of Luz, which is Bethel, southward. So um, there in the first couple of verses, we see uh, the borders being set. There in verses 12, we read a little bit of that, and uh, 13 also. That's going to be the northern border of this territory that Benjamin has acquired from the Lord 
and that's going to be their boundary, at least on the northern side. So verses 12 through 13 discuss the, um, the northern border of the tribe of Benjamin and their inheritance. Uh, down in verse 13, I don't know that I read all of that, but the border went over from there to lose. I did read uh, there, and after southward, the border descended from Adaroth, Adar, near the hill that lies on the south side of lower Beth Haron. So that area there going up from the Jordan and cutting westward would go up all the way around to Luz and down to, uh, it looks like toward Beeroth there, um, down to the lower side of Beth Haron. So having that as the uh, northern border, verse 14 would describe the western boundary. Uh, there in verse 14, the, the border extended around the west side to the south from the hill that lies before Beth Haron, southward, and it ended at Kirjath Baal, which is Kirjath Jerem, a city of the children of Judah. This was the west side. So again, all the way coming over, I don't know that you could tell there's not that city mentioned there, Kirjath Jerem, on this map. I don't think it's on one of the other ones either. But uh, nonetheless, that would be the border there in the uh, Western Territory, and that would be uh, the western border of Benjamin. So again, going down, this portion being given to Benjamin by God, we see the southern border in verse 15, beginning there. The south side began at the end of kirjath Jerem, and the border extended on the west and north to the spring of the waters of Nephtoah. The border came down to the end of the mountain that lies before uh, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And I think the question was asked there in chapter, uh, question 7, what do you know about the valley of the son of Hinnom? That actually occurs as a, a flank on the side of Jerusalem. On the side of Jerusalem is this valley of Hinnom. And this is where allusion is made later about this being Gehenna. Uh, uh, the valley of Hinnom uh, actually is uh, where history would indicate Jerusalem burned their trash and it would be a constant burning pit. Uh, therefore, the terminology and the idea of Gehenna or hell, the, the, the punishment, the condemnation uh, from God. So that would be uh, the Valley of Hinnom there. It also mentions that the Rephaim were there, the giants, uh, there in verse um, 16. So uh, it's in the Valley of Hinnom to the side of the Jebusite city on the south and descended to Enrogel. Again, the Jebusite city being Jerusalem. And that was one city that wasn't, uh, wasn't taken uh, by Judah. But nonetheless, continuing on, this is the southern side of Jordan. You can see Jerusalem down here in the Valley of Hinnom mentioned at the southern border. So this would be the boundary of where it would come back and flow back into Jerusalem and then go back around toward the Jordan, which we'll get to uh, the rest of our, our verses here up to verse 20. So um, it descended to Enrogel and went from the north, went on to Enshemesh and extended toward Geliloth, which is before the ascent of Adumim. And some of these names are beginning to be hard to pronounce, but the locations are there uh, and the border was established. And by the way, some of these cities that are mentioned, they were already there. They were already overtaken. Uh, as part of the conquest of the land. So um, these were cities, and God did mention earlier uh, that he would give them cities that they, could, uh, they were not going to build. He would give them houses to dwell in that they didn't build and vineyards that they didn't plant. This is part of that promise that God would give to them. So when you're going through this, uh, remember that these cities and these places that are mentioned, they're established in that survey. They, they were there and the, the, they were written down so that uh, they would be uh, passed on to one who would retain that lot that was cast by Joshua. And some of these other cities there, verse 19, Beth Hogla. Uh, then the border ended at the North Bay, the Salt Sea. So again, uh, the northern side there on the lower part of this map, the Salt Sea, this is the North Bay. So this is where actually the end of Benjamin's border would be on the southeast corner. So well-defined, this territory here, God would establish this for the tribe of Benjamin, and that would be their lot. That would be something they would receive as an inheritance. As God had promised long ago to Abraham, they're receiving that now, the, the, the promise of a land. They're getting that inheritance. So we see these things taking place, and 
God's will unfolding to the children of Israel at that time. So um, the eastern border, uh, I don't know that we discussed that, but there in verse 20, the Jordan was its border. We mentioned that earlier, and that's where we started uh, going on the northern side. But it ended there at the Jordan, and that was the east side. It says there in verse 20, this was the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to its boundaries, all around according to their families. And we'll have a note there just to talk about that part there about according to their families in just a minute. So the cities there in the remainder of the chapter down to verse 28 are mentioned as being a part of this land. And there are some cities there worthy of note. I don't think I'll go through and uh, try to read and say each one of these cities. But you'll notice there with me if you'll look, verse 21, uh, now the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, according to their families, were... First one there, Jericho. Where did we see that? That was one of the first cities they attacked when they crossed over the Jordan. So Benjamin receives that city. Uh, we have a few others there going through and skimming through from verse 23. Uh, none really of note that we would re uh, remember or look at so far except in verse 25 uh, where it says, Gibeon, Ramah, Biroth. Some of these, uh, as it asks the question, um, what are some of the prominent cities that are found in the territory of Benjamin. I don't know if you remember, you'll look at it later as we go through the, the book of Samuel. Ramah actually was where Samuel resided and he would make a circuit and always return back to his home city of Ramah. Um, also we see Mizpah there, we see um, some of the others, Jebus, it says there, which is Jerusalem. We've already talked about the Jebusite city earlier, well, that's Jerusalem. It would say there in verse 28. Uh, Gibeath and Kirjath, we've already mentioned kirjath Jerem. Um, I wasn't actually able to establish that that was kirjath Jerem or Kirjath, but nonetheless that city is mentioned in several places. And it's mentioned there 14 cities with their villages. This was the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to their families. So the cities there that were mentioned, some of them prominent, some of them we'll remember as we study uh, the Word of God and go through it in the Old Testament. Um, but this was the tribe of Benjamin, and that was their boundary and their territory. So, uh, having all those looked at, I did want to get to a couple more points. Um, Donnie mentioned there in question nine, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at that. Um, and in question nine it says, notice the number of times the expression according to their families appears. We've already mentioned it there in verse 20, at the end of verse 20, where it says according to its boundaries all around, according to their families, and then again there, at the end of verse 28, according to their families. So, so what would be the importance of that appearing twice? Well, um, they were doing things with their families, and it was important that they did that with their families as part of the tribe. That it wasn't, I, I believe, just the tribe taking over the land. Um, we see things such as Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, uh, actually the whole of chapter 6, and also chapter 11 uh, mentions it again, but children and families were important to God and he wanted those children, he wanted those families to remember what God had done through teaching, through uh, building up in what God had done and God's power. So that could be part of it. Uh, I thought maybe that would go along with it, but also um, much is said in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19 and also throughout the Old Testament, just have a couple of passages here, about not removing the ancient landmark. These were boundaries set by God, and also as the families went in and took up their portion and their inheritance, there will be markers on that land to say, this is my land, this is your land. And what we see the encouragement being mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and also verse 27, verse 17, they were not to remove those landmarks. They were important. They were something to be established and remembered, and God wanted them as families to remember what he had done through several ways and several means but, but I think it's important. They were doing these things according to their families. It wasn't just that the tribe was going to go in and settle the land and, well, so-and-so gets this place over there and that one gets this place over there. No, there was an order to it. And the order was there for a reason. God established that. And God wanted those people, those children of Israel, to remember what he had done and how it was that they got the land. We see that all throughout the Old Testament and how they forsook it, how they left the Lord and how they would serve the gods and the, uh, serve the, actually be and bondage to other people as they did not subdue them and remove them from the land. So some good uh, important points there. Um, 
I, uh, I didn't get to most of my slides that Donnie had prepared, but just going over them, um, I did want to kind of wrap, wrap up and round out the lesson now that we've got maybe a few more minutes to finish up. So um, looking through all of these points here, the borders of Israel, uh, that was the majority of the verse or the uh, chapter. Some of the lessons learned we can get to now, and then after this uh, we'll, we'll end our class and study together. But in chapter 12 especially, but worship is as God chooses and as he establishes. It wasn't just by chance that Gilgal was set up. It wasn't just by chance that Shiloh now is the place that we find the children of Israel in chapter 18, but, but God decided. And that's important, very important today, although people neglect it and they don't consider it. God places importance on where we worship and how we worship him. He's always been that way, even beginning with Cain and Abel. But now we see, going through this study of chapter 18, God set that up. Also, uh, another point of uh, lesson learned, there in verse 3, when Joshua asked the question, how long will we neglect? Um, it's a good question when anything is neglected. Are we going to neglect this? Or are we going to neglect that? Some things definitely need to be neglected in our life. We need to cut them out. We need to remove them as dead weight to serve the Lord. But other things that are spiritual that, that the Lord wants us to do, are we going to neglect those things? The children of Israel, they were doing that. Um, it could have been, as uh, had mentioned there, in that reason that they were lacking faith and zeal. I, I think maybe they were getting also complacent, and they didn't go forward as they were instructed. But nonetheless, the time was over for neglect. Um, don't neglect, and the point there, don't neglect obeying the Lord. And finally, that point there that we talked about, about emphasis on the family. It, it's easy to get distracted and waylaid by things that, are important to the family to let those things go to the side and seek out yourself and do what you want even as a parent it's easy to neglect your children it's easy to neglect your wife or your wife to neglect the husband or vice versa so it's easy to do that but it's important God places importance in some of these least of things to the family and how important it is that's uh, that's the lesson we're a little short on time here I'm going to enter class but uh, we'll, we'll stop there and Next time we'll study chapter 19.